Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so this is going to be a tutorial on a recent paper which is joint work with Tim Roughgarden and which is aimed at developing a, a general framework for the analysis of permissionless consensus protocols, be they proof of work, proof of stake, proof of space or, or whatever. So in the tutorial, I'm only going to be able to go into things at uh, quite a high level. So if you're interested in the details, I definitely recommend you check out the, the actual paper, which has the same title. Okay, it's called Permissionless Consensus, and you can find that on our web pages. Okay, so let's start off with uh, a little bit of motivation. So I guess the, the first most basic question to address here is, is why do we need a general framework? Uh, and so certainly a basic answer to that is that uh, you know, impossibility results play a uh, fundamental role in establishing any, any well-developed theory. And you can't prove, uh, rig no, you can't rigorously prove impossibility results without a well-defined um, uh, general framework. So certainly in the uh, permission setting, uh, that, that's been the case. Okay, so by the permission setting, I just mean the, the classical setting that's been worked on since at least in the, in the 1980s or so. Uh, so the permission setting is the one in which we have a fixed set of, uh, of known participants. Okay, so certainly in the, in the permission setting, uh, impossibility results have played a, a fundamental role in, in building the theory. Uh, there are many examples of that. So uh, um, a very well-known example is the FLP theorem. Right, So we have this very nice theorem of Fisher, Lynch and Paterson, which says that if a protocol is going to operate in asynchrony, right, whatever that means, if a protocol is going to operate in asynchrony, then some randomness is required. Okay, so that's that's a nice theorem, but it also plays you know, a, a, a role on a day-to-day -day basis as we go about defining protocols. Right? Because if we're going to define a protocol and we want it to work in asynchrony, then we know some randomness is, randomness is required. Okay, so there's, there's one example. You can give many more examples. <clears throat> Certainly in the permission setting, impossibility results have, have played a crucial role. How about for the permissionless setting? Uh, well, so there have been various frameworks which have been developed and which suffice to model and analyze proof of work protocols. Okay, but prior to the stuff I'm going to talk about today, there's no uh, general framework which suffices to uh, model and analyze permissionless protocols more generally. Okay, and basically, you know, the reason for that, or one of the reasons for that, um, as I'll explain later on, is basically because existing frameworks don't have adequate language for what we'll, um, for talking about what, what, we'll, what we'll call on-chain resources. Okay? Uh, and in particular, so we'll, we'll see various results today that can't be explained uh, in previous frameworks. Okay, so if I minimize myself here so you can see the slide. Um, so one of the things we want to achieve uh, in this tutorial is to precisely define what we mean by uh, the permissionless setting. Okay, what do we mean by permissionless protocols? Something that makes that uh, slightly more difficult is that people often think of some protocols as being, in some sense, more permissionless than others. So, for example, people might think of you know, proof-of-work protocols as being, in some sense, more permissionless than proof-of-stake protocols. So how can we make that precise? Well, what we'll actually do is define a hierarchy of four settings, okay? From, from most permissionless down to least permissionless. Okay, and, I, and I'm gonna define uh, these settings more precisely later on in, in the tutorial, but I thought I'd just start off by giving a, a brief sort of overview. Okay, so from, from uh, starting with the, the most permissionless then, so the, the, the hardest of the settings to operate in is what we call the fully permissionless setting. Okay, and this is the setting that protocols like standard proof of work protocols like Bitcoin, okay, they operate in the fully permissionless setting. And the basic idea is as follows, in the fully permissionless setting, at each moment in time, the protocol has no knowledge about which nodes are currently running it. As I say, so I'm giving a sort of high level overview now, or we'll, we'll give a more precise version later on. Okay, so each moment in time, the protocol has no knowledge about which nodes are running it. Of course, in practice, you might have some you know, good idea about who the major miners are, etc. But the point is that that's not necessary for the protocol to operate effectively. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind the fully permissionless setting. Uh, then we consider a relaxation of that, a slight relaxation of that, which we call the dynamically available setting. Okay, and uh, the thing to have in mind here is that uh, so standard longest chain proof of stake protocols, such as Ouroboros or Snow White, they operate in the dynamically available setting. Okay, so, what, so why is this that setting, uh, why is the DA setting easier to operate in? 
Okay, so in the fully permissionless setting, the protocol has no idea who's currently running a protocol. In a dynamically available setting, that's no longer true. At each moment in time now, the protocol is aware of a dynamically evolving list of IDs. Okay, so think of a proof of stake protocol. Think about the set of finalized transactions and who owns stake according to that set of transactions or who owns stake in escrow according to that set of transactions. Okay, so now at each moment in time, the protocol is aware of a dynamically evolving list of IDs. And furthermore, we can assume that some honest members of that list will be active in carrying out the protocol. Okay, we might also make assumptions of the sort that you know, at least I mean, that actually a majority of the uh, active members of that list will be honest. Okay, so as I say, you should think of you know, standard longest chain proof of state protocols as operating in this setting. Let me move on to consider a, a relaxation of the dynamically available setting, which we call the quasi permissionless setting. Okay. Uh, so now the difference is that, so again, again, the protocol is aware of this dynamically evolving list of ID, uh, IDs. But whereas in the dynamically available setting, we, we couldn't assume that you know, everybody, all, all members, or at least all honest members of that list would be active and carry out the protocol. Like we don't know how many are actually going to turn up. In the quasi permissionless setting, we're able to assume that all honest members of that list of IDs will be active in carrying out the protocol. Okay. And in particular, this allows us to, do, uh, to carry out... Uh, protocols you know, which require quorums. Okay, so yeah, so you should think of standard proof of stake BFT style protocols, the kind of protocols that use quorums and quorum certificates, right? Protocols such as Algorand, they operate in this setting. Okay. It's not just for proof of stake protocols though. There are also certain proof of work protocols such as Bizcoin, Hybrid and Sleeder that operate in the quasi permissionless setting. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail later on. So that's the quasi permissionless setting. And then finally, the easiest setting to operate in is the permission setting. Okay, this is the standard classical setting in which we have a fixed set of known and always active participants. Okay, so this is a, a hierarchy of settings. It's a strict hierarchy, each, uh, each level being easier than those above, which means that if we prove any impossibility result for a certain level of the hierarchy, then that impossibility result automatically holds all levels above, right? So if we, if we prove an impossibility result for the DA, the dynamically available setting, that automatically holds for the fully, fully permissionless setting. Okay, so this is a, 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 a hierarchy of settings rather than protocols. But what we'll do then is we'll allocate a protocol to the harshest setting in which it's live and consistent or in which it operates effectively. Okay, so for example, we'll refer to Bitcoin as a fully permissionless protocol because it operates in the fully permissionless setting. We'll refer to Algorand as a quasi permissionless protocol because it operates in the quasi permissionless setting. Okay, and then what I want to try and persuade you of uh, in this, in this uh, sequence of videos is that actually often what's possible is not necessarily so much a function of whether the protocol is proof of work or proof of stake or whatever. It's really often a function of the, the setting in which you operate. Okay, so often it's the setting which delineates what's possible. And we'll see lots of uh, examples of that. Okay, so we'll see uh, a result which suffices to separate the, the FP, the fully permissionless, and then the dynamically available settings. So in particular, what we'll see is that uh, fully permissionless protocols can't be deterministic. Okay, so Bitcoin operates in the fully permissionless setting. It's a probabilistic protocol. And according to the results we'll see today, so now we know, in fact, that's necessarily the case. Okay? Fully permissionless protocols can't be deterministic, whereas the dynamically available protocols can be. Okay, so that separates the, the FP and the DA settings, the fully permissionless and dynamically available settings. And then we'll also see a, a number of results which suffice to separate the dynamically available and quasi-permissionless settings. So dynamically available protocols can't function in partial synchrony whereas quasi-permissionless protocols can do. Okay, that's one separation. Another separation is that dynamically available protocols can't be optimistically responsive. Okay, I'll define what that means more precisely later on. But roughly being optimistically responsive just means that the, <coughs> the latency is a function of an actual message delay rather than known upper bound on message delay. Okay, so roughly speaking, it means that the protocol proceeds at network speed. Okay, so I say I'll, I'll define that more precisely later on. Okay, so dynamically available protocols can't be optimistically responsive, quasi-permissionless protocols can be. And it's also true that dynamically available protocols can't be accountable, 
whereas quasi permissionless protocols can be. Okay, again, so I'll, I'll define accountability more precisely later on, but roughly speaking, being accountable just means that the protocol produces incontrovertible proofs of guilt in the case of a consistency violation. Okay, so this has to do with slashing. Okay, okay so dynamically available protocols can't be accountable, and quasi permissionless protocols can be. <clears throat> Okay, and there are various different ways we can separate the quasi-permissionless and permission settings. One way is to uh, <coughs> use the, the EAC property. Okay, uh, If you want to understand the EAC property, then you'll have to look into another paper, which is with uh, by me, Tim, and Eric Budish. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of that today. Um, but certainly the EAC property is one way we can separate the quasi-permissionless and permission settings. Uh, and we'll see an another way of separating these those two settings later on. Okay, so that's a uh, brief sort of overview. Uh, as I say, obviously, I'll, I'll define all these settings more precisely later on, and we'll, we'll, we'll see proofs of, the, of some of the separations. Uh, so next, let's just briefly say a bit about the structure of the tutorial. Okay, so... Um, okay, if you're going to talk about permissionless protocols, then generally we're going to want to consider what we'll call resources of some kind. Okay, so by resources, I mean things like hash rate, memory chips, stake, that sort of thing. So generally, we're going, to, we're going to want to consider resources of some kind. To begin with, though, I want to introduce, uh, first of all, a version of the fully permissionless setting without resource restrictions. Okay. So we'll introduce the fully permissionless setting without resource restrictions, first of all. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll sketch a, a proof showing that consensus actually is not possible in a fully permissionless setting without resource restrictions. Okay. So that then motivates the introduction of resources. So that's what we'll do next. Okay, so then we'll, we'll go on to consider resources. And for us, resources will be of two types. Okay, resources are either external or they're on chain. Okay, so external resources are you know, things like hash rate and memory chips. On chain resources are things such as stake, but we'll see some other examples later on. Okay, and then once we define resources, then we can define the fully permissionless setting proper and okay, the fully permissionless setting with resource restrictions. Okay, and from then on, by the fully permissionless setting, I'll always mean the fully permissionless setting with resource restrictions. Okay, and then we'll see our first impossibility result. I say consensus protocols for the fully permissionless setting cannot be deterministic. Then we'll go on to define the dynamically available setting, right, a re relaxation of the fully, permission, fully permissionless setting. We'll see a couple more results for which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll either well, some of the results will give full proofs, some will give, we'll give uh, sketches. Okay, so we'll see a, a fairly full proof of the fact there exist protocols for solving Byzantine agreement in the dynamically available setting that are deterministic. Okay, so that suffices to separate the DA and the FP settings. I apologize for the number of acronyms on the screen, by the way. So obviously, by FP, I mean fully permissionless. By DA, I mean dynamically available. And BA here means by, is, stands for Byzantine agreement. Okay, and we'll sketch another result showing that dynamically available protocols can't solve consensus in the partial synchrony model. Okay, and then basically what we'll do is we'll just continue working down the hierarchy. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to define the quasi-permissionless setting. I'm going to start off by defining the quasi-permissionless setting, first of all, just for stake. Okay, and then I'll give some examples of other, chain form, other forms of on-chain resources, so you know, you know what I mean by that. Uh, and we'll formally define what we mean by on-chain resources. And having done that, we can then define the, the, the quasi permissionless setting proper. Okay, and then we'll see various impossibility and possibility results that suffice to separate the dynamically available and quasi permissionless settings. Okay, and then the last thing we want to do is to uh, see uh, at least some way of separating the quasi permissionless and permission settings. Okay, and there are various ways you can do that. Um, we're, in order to achieve that, uh, I'm going to take one particular uh, route. And in particular, I want to revisit what it means for the adversary to have bounded on-chain resources. Because that, that might sound like a fairly obvious sort of thing. Okay? It seems fairly clear what it means to say the adversary always has like, you know, most of the third of the stake or whatever. But actually, we'll see there are various different approaches you can take in that regard. And actually, you know, uh, <clears throat> the precise definition you write down, the precise approach you take can make a big difference as to what's possible. Okay, so we'll go into the details there, and once we've done that, then that will give us a, a nice way of separating the quasi-permissionless and permission settings. Okay, so that's the, the basic structure, 
Uh, in the next video, we'll go on to uh, start introducing the fully permissionless setting.